let me invite our speaker. Father in heaven, thank you so much for a beautiful passage of scripture. We are hot. Some of us are uncomfortable. Some of us are feeling certain burdens of thoughts, of emotions, of distractions. Father, would, for a few minutes, would you allow us to calm down? Would you allow us to just be quiet in your presence? Not listen to our body and all of its 101 excuses. And just focus in on what you're saying to our soul, what you're saying to our spirit. Father God, we need to hear your voice. For man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Last time, we talked about, it was part 12, we talked about excuses wrapped in traditions. Excuses wrapped in traditions. And we said that traditions are good, traditions are dangerous, traditions are religious, but traditions can mask, traditions can mask a lifeless, faithless, powerless, loveless, rebellious heart. I mean, you can be any kind of person you want on the inside, but on the outside, you can look awesome because of certain things you do, certain things you, you know, the, the way you carry on with your traditions. You can come across very godly and very um, spiritual, but you're not. And all of these traditions can produce excellent, wonderful excuses for a Christless Christianity. For a crisis, that's what we talked about last time. Now Jesus is going to continue down this path and I don't want to miss the one and only thing that he's saying to us today. Jesus continues to talk and discuss the issue or the matter of the heart. The matter of the heart. Last time we focused when traditions become an excuse to not give God what he wants, live life how you should, uh, or obey God with a whole heart. A tradition then replaces the word of God. And that is very, very dangerous. All right, so let's dive in. Short passage of scripture. Give your best to pay attention and you will go home a little bit more blessed. All right, verse 14. Chapter seven of Gospel of Mark, verse 14. He called the people to him again and said to them, hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable he just talked about. And he said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him since it enters into his heart, but his stomach and is expelled next morning? Thus, in parenthesis, he says, he declared all foods clean. Verse 20, and he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveted, coveting, wickedness, deceitfulness, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, etc. All these things, <coughs> excuse me, all these evil things come from within and they defile a person. We're going to go back to that and look at it. If you have a Bible, that's awesome. If you don't, it's on the screen. But at some point, you want to go back and re-look at this. And especially in home groups, in home CL homes, if you could just go back to this and say, you know what, how does this look like in our life? What do we need to uh, put in place in our life? So that there's some practical discussion. Let's go back to verse 14. He called other people again, and he begins to teach. No problem, cool. And he says, hear me, I want you to understand something. All of you, I want you to understand something. <clears throat> He's talking still about traditions. He's talking about traditions. Before he talked about mother, father and looking after them and how you are deceitful in that. Now he's going to talk about food because food was such a thing. Food was such a big thing with these people and everything related to food was so important to them and so either segregated them from others or united them with others. So the Lord Jesus is going to elaborate on traditions and customs that he has been citing as an excuse for inward pride and selflessness or self uh, sinfulness are you with me so far are you with me so far very simple jesus is on the same subject he's talking about how we abuse traditions and he's talking about what the heart of the matter really is the issue of personal purity the issue of personal purity you're not pure because you dress in white you're not pure because you don't wear any gold you're not pure because you cover your head you're not pure are you getting the idea you could do what you want, but God looks on the heart. God looks on the heart. So he starts in verse 15. And he says, there is nothing, underline that, there is nothing, 
absolutely nothing outside of a person. So there's me, there's my body, there's inside, there's outside. There's nothing outside of a person that can defile me, that can corrupt me, that can make me dirty or unclean. Can we accept that as a truth coming straight from Jesus' mouth? That means food. No food is unclean. That means no people that you fellowship with are unclean. That means no place you go can make you unclean. You get where I'm going with this? There is no off stage, on stage, more holy than there is nothing that can make you unclean from the outside. Nothing absolutely at all. So go back to verse 15. There is nothing outside a person going into him, whatever is going into him, obviously food, drink, going into him that can defile him. Nothing. Okay. What is Jesus doing here? Is this some sadhu type of teaching? Is this some kind of just general, you know, health and digestion sort of uh, good works sort of thing? Is this some kind of just wellness teaching? We could either go, either go down that track and think, oh, he's the same as everybody else. Look at all these other sadhu, sadhus and teachers and from Deepak Chopra and everybody else. They're all saying the same thing. Oh, wonderful. Jesus also is on the same page. Ah, hang on. There is nothing outside a person going into him that can defile him. We are going to understand what Jesus is saying today. And when the son of God takes on such a small matter and drives deep into it, we want to make sure we haven't missed the point. Going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person. Let's read it together. But the things that come out together. But the things that come out of a person. So what makes me corrupt? What makes me defiled? It's what comes out. What was already there, but comes out. Now I want to get to the heart of that matter. What comes out? When it comes out, it makes me a defiled person. Okay, so I have many questions as I look at this passage of scripture. And so did the disciples. Verse 17, the disciples asked for an explanation. And that's what disciples do. Disciples should ask. That's what makes them disciples. Verse 18. And he said to them, then you also, <coughs> you also are without understanding. Come on, Jesus. Go easy on these fellows. You know, they're trying their best. But he expects the disciples to know different. He expects the disciples to know different. Why? Because Jesus has been teaching and demonstrating a faith that is inward. I repeat. Jesus has been teaching and demonstrating a faith that is inward, a heart that is contrite, a prayer that is humble, a mind that is repentant. Are you with me? He has been teaching this. Teen Saal Nikal He's Three years he's been sitting and talking about, it's not what you eat. It's not where you go. It's not what you look like. It's not the days of the week. It's not the rising and the setting of the sun. It's not how much is, is wrapped around. It's your heart. It's your heart. And he says, you guys still don't understand this. You, you, you still don't get this. So he expects disciples to be one step ahead of everybody else. And these guys apparently at that point were not. So hence the sarcasm. He's been screaming at his, uh, till his voice went sore, trying to devalue, listen, trying to devalue rules without a relationship. Religion without repentance. Godliness without power. His disciples should get it by now, but here we are. So he has to explain. Do you not see whatever goes into the person from outside cannot defile him? McDonald's burger. Let's discuss that. It's basically cancer. McDonald's burger is rubbish, okay? Uh, it, it can last for 10 years and it will not even degrade. So you're talking wellness. You're talking wellness. But Jesus is talking about a defiling of the person, Wickedness, unrighteousness, nothing that goes into me makes me defiled because if I eat, <coughs> and this is not the point, let's zone in on the point here. If I eat, where is it going to go? And then tomorrow morning? All right? So that's not the problem. Here is the problem. What goes in doesn't defile since, underline this, since it enters not his heart. Since it enters not his heart. Now you've got to stop and ask, okay, there's my heart. 
And what goes into my heart defiles my heart. And what comes out of my heart defiles my heart. My heart is, the, is what makes me righteous or what make, makes me defiled. It's my heart. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. His teaching is not about the stomach and he's not talking about foods and he's not saying, don't eat this, eat this, this is okay. He's not coming to say, you know what, everything you've been eating that you thought was clean or unclean, he's not talking about that. He's saying the issue is that it does not go into the heart and that is why it does not defile. If you got that, you got it. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23, above all else, guard your heart. Why? For everything you do flows from it. Everything you do flows from your heart. Psalm 51 verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a, say it, are a broken spirit, a broken contrite heart. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. Mark chapter 7, going back to what we talked about earlier, verse 6. He replied, as I was right about you people when he prophesied about you hypocrites. Uh, and it was written, he says, these people honor me with their lips. Say it, but their hearts are far from me. Oh, they all sing it out loud. They are four part harmony. They have a wonderful time. They sing and sing and sing. <coughs> and they have long times of worship, but their hearts are far from me. Jesus was making a point and we do not want to miss that. Of course, in verse 19, in parenthesis, he says, thus he declared all foods clean. That's there and that's for our benefit. Jump to verse 20. So what comes out is what defiles him. How? 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 How does something that is inside me come out and then defile me? Now I'm thinking, if it's already inside me, does that not already defile me? If I have a wicked heart and that heart has the propensity for all of these horrible things, that wicked heart, does that not make me a wicked person? Are you thinking with me? Does that wicked heart and the propensity of that wicked heart not make me a wicked person? And Jesus is saying, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. The heart is wicked above all things. The heart is desperately wicked above all else. But listen to this. What comes out is what defiles him. No one can make you a bad person. I hope you're putting it together. Not burgers, not biryani, not food, not drink. What goes in, not that because it goes into the stomach, it doesn't go into the heart. What goes into the heart is what defiles you. What comes out of the heart is what defiles you. You, no one can make you a bad person. You are as bad as you want to be. You are as bad as you want to be. It's a heart issue, an issue of your heart. If you are a wicked person, it's because you want to be that. If you are a righteous person, it's because you want to be that. Not the devil, not the culture, not your parents, not your upbringing, nothing else around you. No foods, no nothing else around you is what defiles you. The def defiling comes from within and you wanted it. You loved it. You gave it a shot. You wanted to try it. You thought that maybe God was cheating you <coughs> and you said to yourself, has God really said, and I want to give it a shot. And once it came out, you lost control and now you can't put it back in again. Nothing and no one else can make me wicked, can make my heart wicked. The heart is desperately wicked on its own above all else. And I, only I, am responsible for my heart. So that begs the question, how does it defile him on the way out? How does it defile him on the way out? Because I would think that if my heart is filled with all these wicked things, that would make me a wicked person. I have a wicked heart, so I'm a wicked person. That's logic. But he says, no, the heart may be wicked, but God can deal with the heart. But when you don't want that heart, don't want God to deal with the heart. Don't want God to change that heart. Don't want God to replace that heart. Don't want God to enter that heart. Don't want, want God's heart to, to be entwined with your heart. When you don't want that, all those things are released into your life one by one. Let me explain. How does it defile him on the way out when he had it in him all the time? 
Jesus was referencing propensity, propensity. Look that up. Theologians call it total depravity. Romans 1, the book of Romans, Romans 1 calls it cut off from life, the meat will rot. Cut off from life, the meat will rot. Anybody had food poisoning? Yeah? How long does it take and how much does it take for just one section, one part of the Kati roll to begin to turn? Just one part of the Kati roll to begin to turn and you're writing an application for leave. <laughs> Cut off from life, the meat will rot. So that heart is desperately wicked because it is cut off from the heart of God. But if that heart will will, if that heart will will to be one with God, to be close to God, to allow God to surrender, uh, to, to allow God to take over and come in and cleanse, God says, I will give you a new heart. I will put my spirit in you. I will teach you my ways. I will enlighten you. And when God pours his spirit and truth and cleansing into your heart, your heart then begins to dispel the things. And from within, deep within you, deep down in the, in the cathedral of your being, you begin to commune with God. You begin to experience holiness. You begin to experience prayer. You begin to experience forgiveness. You begin to experience warmth and peace deep down in the cathedral of your being. There, in the inner sanctum of your presence with God, where he and you choose to co-dwell, there, your heart is open and God does open heart surgery. God does, lays you on a table and cleans you out. He takes one after the other, takes things out and he renders you clean. Cleanse my heart, O oh God. Make it ever new. Cleanse my heart, O oh God. Make it ever new. There, not outside. Not outside, not in the context of marriage, not in the context of home group, not at some Bible study, not during some worship place. Deep inside, in the temple of your being, that's where God meets you and that's where God does his open heart surgery. And that's where forgiveness happens, peace happens, strength happens, joy happens. The birth of God, that is the conversion experience of you becoming a child of God happens deep inside that place. So he says, for from within, out of the heart, from within, out of the heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, evil, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. This is not a list of sins. This is not a list of sins. This is a list of the symptoms of the rotting of the flesh that has been cut off from life. When your heart is cut off from life, this was what will show up because it has the propensity to do that. How far can a heart go when it is disconnected from God? How dark can a mind get when it is disconnected from God? How bleak can a situation get when it is disconnected with God? Look around. Look around. Look at the wars. Look at the tragics, tragedies. Look at the trafficking of humans. Look at the economies. Look at the poverty, look at your world and you will know how bad your life, your heart can be when meat is cut off from life. Meat cut off from life will begin to rot and there is rotting and stench all around us and God gives you an opportunity for life to dwell, for life to grow right in the middle of all the corruption and defiling all around you. He says, you will be like lights in a dark world. He says, you will be in the world, but not off the world. He says, you will be among them, but you will be mine. I will put my life in you and I will give you abundant life and you will know me and I will know you. And that is the will of the father. These are not a list of do's and don'ts that you should and shouldn't do. This is what will happen if you're far from the Lord. And if you're close to the Lord, this is what won't happen. God was won't happen. God is not rating your sinfulness. He is weighing your heart. All these things, verse 23, all these things come from within, underline within, and they, the things, defile the person. Why? Why? 
बिकॉज इन माई टैंक ऊपर जो है देर इज अ लेयर ऑफ गंक एट द बॉटम बट वी डोंट डिस्टर्ब इट वॉटर फिल्स वॉटर गोज डाउन वॉटर फिल्स वॉटर गोज डाउन एंड वी ट्राई नॉट टू गेट टू द बॉटम वेर द वॉटर कंप्लीटली गोज डाउन टू द बॉटम यू नॉट आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट बिकॉज देन एंड द वॉटर गोज डाउन एंड द टैंक इज एम टी आई गेटिंग इट एंड द टैंक इज एम टी दैट्स वैन अरे ब्राउन वॉटर इज कमिंग यार वे इट वॉज देयर ऑल अलॉन्ग ब्रदर्स एंड सिस्टर्स इट वॉज देयर ऑल अलॉन्ग वेन द टैंक इज एम टी यू गोन सी वॉट्स एट द बॉटम Proverbs chapter four, verse twenty-three. Above all else, above your front door, above your insurance, above your children's future, above your fears and concerns, above all else, guard your heart. That's what needs lock and key. Guard your heart for everything you do. Underline that. So important. Everything you do. What is do? Actions. What comes before actions? Feelings. What comes before feelings? Thinking. Everything you do. started in your heart it started in your heart you are only as bad as you want to be so we have come to admit that our hearts are wicked far from god capable of the worst ungodliness but when we will capital w when we will to think on and act on these things that will defines how wicked we are that will defines how wicked we are so when god looks across a, play, a, a group of people he doesn't look at what wickedness you have done because he's paid for that he looks at your heart and see what wickedness you are open to what wickedness you are open to the heart that wants to be far from god is the heart that's open to wickedness a heart that wants to be close to god is willing to surrender and leave and and, and give up on wickedness because it's not going to happen that will is not to believe not to surrender not give the glory to god not submit to his purposes not acknowledge christ that is the will that god shuns god doesn't condemn us for having cancer he judges us for not wanting the remedy so it's there but when i give way to it it comes out and permeates every part of my thinking and feeling and doing it destroys me completely it destroys me completely let's take some examples let's take lust for instance once i give way to lust let's take cheating for instance once i learned a way to cheat my way through life whether it's time whether it's results whether it's achievement accomplishment once i way to manipulate once i find a way to manipulate and i start doing that and i'm willing to do that there is no limit to how far my heart will go and when my heart goes that far it doesn't turn to come back to god so the first no to premarital sex to drugs to lying to fudging your resume the first no is always easier it's always easier if you said yes three times after that i'm like oh, yeah might as well might as well and by the time you get to 10 times yes you start defining yourself as a wicked person as a liar as a cheater as a hypocrite as an imposter so say no the first time the first time is the easiest never getting into it in the first place never going into that direction at all do not flirt with sin not to be deluded that you can control it if you can just play with it just a little bit and indulge with just just a bit when you say yes to something you're saying no to something else When you say yes to something you're going to say no to something else and guess what is the first thing to go from your life when you start saying yes to these things it's your faith it's your faith and the things that are that matter to god those are the first things that go so deeds your actions are nothing your actions your deeds are nothing without motivation and that is the heart of the issue are you with me what you did you'll say oh he never he did much more or he never did But well, the question is where did it come from what is the motivation and the motivation comes from the heart the actions are in the body the thinking is in your mind but the motivation comes from the heart therefore above all else guard your heart for it is the well spring of life so let me ask you a question as i conclude why is the heart so important to god why is the heart so important to god Why does he demand integrity in the inward parts? 
Why does he demand that we follow him with a whole heart, not a divided heart? Why does God offer in both the Old Testament and New Testament a new heart? Come to me and I will replace your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Why does he offer? Why is the heart so important to God? Are you ready for this? Because in his sovereign will and gracious purpose, because in his sovereign will and gracious purpose, he has made man the dwelling place of God. He has made man the dwelling place of God. For the son of God, does not have a place to rest his head. He does not dwell in houses and temples and mansions. He comes to dwell in you. Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you. And God has chosen to come down and be with you and be within you. And that is why the place he wants to rent for the life you have needs to be clean. And when he's living there, he needs to run the show. He needs to have authority. The desire of the Father is to be close to you, near you, within. The Spirit of God is, is given to you to be with you and to be in you. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 to 17, he says, But set Christ apart as Lord in your hearts, always ready to make a defense to anyone who asks for, for you, for an accounting concerning the hope that is in you. The hope that is set Christ apart as Lord. Where? In your hearts. Romans chapter 5. This hope, this hope does not put us to shame because God's love has poured out, has been poured out into our hearts. See, everything God has to do with you has to do with your heart. Your heart is his dwelling place. Your heart is not your dill. It's not your pumping heart. It's not the seat of your uh, of, your, uh, of your thinking and emotions and culture. That is your soul, mind, body, and spirit. But your heart is the will factor of your spirit. The spirit that is going to live forever. The spirit that is complete even without the body, without the sp emotions, without the mind. The spirit that God breathed in to you. Because even the angel Lucifer was a spirit. He's an angel, he's a spirit. But he said in his heart, Isaiah 14, I will be like the most high God. I will, I will, I have five I wills. He had a will. Are you seeing what I'm saying here? The spirit has a will. The body has a will. Forget the body for now. That's where God wants to be. That's where your, your walk with God is. That's where he wants to commune with you. That's where he wants to counsel you out of the pain and hurt and tragedies and the, and the abandonment and rejection of whatever else you've been dealing with. That's where he want to explain, wants to explain to you the eternal things of God. Lead you into all truth. That's where he wants to show you his power. Not in the flesh. That's not God's playing ground. It's in the spirit. And when you open your heart, now we know what we're talking about. Now we know what we're talking about. Why is the heart so important to God? Because God Almighty, because of what Jesus the Son has done, has sent the Spirit of God to dwell in you so he may cohabit, he may dwell with you and in you. That's how close he wants to be. And he can't live with a heart that's cut off from him. He can't live with a heart that's cut off from him. So, number one, feed the heart. Please discuss this in your home groups. Feed the heart. How are you going to do that? Stuff in your, in your mind and, and in, your, in your life, you know, that person you hate, the things that have happened, the struggles that you're going through, the failures, deal with it down there before it comes out and destroys everybody else. Deal with it down there. Bitterness, resentment, deal with it down there. Number two, deal with the heart. Deal within the heart. Number three, replace the heart. Ask God to give you a new heart. Daily, ask God to give you a new heart. Number four, seek the company of godly hearts. Seek the company of other people who have a godly heart, who love the presence of God, love the worship of God. Seek their company. Company checks what comes out. Ah, uh -uh, no, 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 we don't talk like that. No, no, that shouldn't, you shouldn't be watching that. Hey, no, you shouldn't. It checks you, man. Good company checks you and it keeps the heart from bringing out the stuff. But when you go to a company or we spend time with people who allow it to come on, come on, let's let it just have some fun, yeah. live a little. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. And number five, 
Fast, read intensively and practice solitude. Fast, read intensively the word. In chunks, in chunks read the word. So fast from food. Eat God's food. For man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of his mouth. Eat the word of God and spend time in solitude. Because the more you spend time in solitude, cut off the volumes of the world and the and the worship around you, cut it out off, and you spend time alone with God, the voice of God becomes louder, clearer, more dearer. Louder, clearer, more dearer. And that's where God puts out, takes out his scalpel and some open heart surgery happens. That's where. Let me leave you with this. God will not embarrass you in front of your friends. He will not correct you in front of your family. He will not judge you in front of anybody else. He asks you to come alone with him, quietly away. And between him and you, there's some business that happens. And he replaces your heart. He replaces your heart. Open heart surgery. That happens in quiet solitude with him. Some of you can't even remember the last time you've been alone with God. Some of you can't remember the last time you've been alone. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Let me pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, I want this. What this scripture is talking about. I want this. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. I don't understand how it works. I always thought as the heart being the seat of my volition. But being a place of residence for God himself. Being a place where life decisions are made. Being a place that can either harbor rotting meat or holy words. Oh God, renew a right spirit within me. Create a clean heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Dawson. And if you liked what you just saw, if it was a blessing, then hit the subscribe button. Come on, you can do it. Hit the subscribe button, uh, hit the bell so that we know you want to hear from us. Lots of videos coming your way, songs, worship, encouragement. Come on, subscribe. Let's take this forward and share with somebody you might know. Write a comment in the section below. But let's see you guys again. Come on, subscribe.